Jessica, and I'm here to discuss an issue that's been a controversial topic over the past few years I think you guys have heard of. Um, so I'm going to be discussing the side for the growing wealth disparity in the United States, which continues to perpetuate the cycle that oppresses the less fortunate. So the growing wealth disparity in the United States, um, if you guys aren't aware of the concept, um, wealth disparity or wealth inequality is very prevalent right now in American society. So wealth is basically an accumulation of assets um, and investments that are tangible and intangible um, <coughs> measurements of wealth. And wealth inequality is basically the unequal distribution of assets among citizens in terms of cash, investments, homes, and so forth. And if you've been keeping up with the news, many of you would be well aware of the subject um, about how the top 1% has vast majority of the wealth that differs greatly from the bottom 90 to 95%. So the topics I'm going to cover um, concerning why wealth is very oppressive to the less fortunate is one, wealth inequality is a cause and effect that results due to lack of proper funding to educational institutions in lower income areas, and two, wealth inequality negatively affects society's outlook on each other. Three, economic inequity gives the affluent more power and more control to an unfathomable degree over the lives of others. So, to start off, my first point is that wealth inequality is, is a result that is due to the lack of proper funding for educational institutions in lower income areas because wealth ultimately determines the opportunity for educational mobility. And according to the Federal Department of Education, there's evidence to support the claim that the richest 25% of student school districts receive more funding from state and local governments per student than the poorest 25% of school districts. And yes, it's understandable that the affluent will have more access to better resources, and um, this also pertains to education. This is not new, new news. However, it's the imbalance of proper funding that ultimately shortchanges the system and students who, and for the schools who receive less funding. So educational institutions are supposed to be offering fair educational opportunities to students, but if certain schools are being short, shorthanded and other schools are being given more funding, then ultimately this is not giving, this is not considered equal. Um, if certain schools are being offered more funding, this gives others who have access to resources an educational advantage ahead of others. So with income and wealth and quality in place, this does not provide non-native and non-English speakers um, in lower income areas the opportunity to even out the playing field and catch up to their wealthier peers. And my second point is that wealth inequality negatively affects society and society's outlook on each other. So it negatively, negatively affects society because it continues to widen the wealth gap, which means that not everyone's privileged enough to have the same opportunities. By failing to properly allocate proper funding to these programs and educational institutions, um, the less fortunate, this defeats the purpose of the original intention and the purpose that these programs were designed for, which is to aid these people who are less fortunate give them a better chance. <coughs> Sorry. And so according to an article from CNN, they interviewed Richard Wilkinson, who's a well-known British, research, British researcher and a social epidemiologist. So a social epidemiologist is basically a person or an expert who studies and focuses particularly on the effects of social structure factors, uh, predominantly the distribution of advantages and disadvantages in a society that reflect the distribution of health. So Wilkinson states that the benefits of greater inequality are biggest at the bottom of society, but a number of studies suggest that a large majority, perhaps 90 to 95% of the population benefits from greater inequality. So basically, he's just saying it doesn't just affect the poor, and he's making the claim that a good majority of the population, 90 to 95%, will benefit um, if there was a greater equality in the system. Um, he also makes a very valid point that um, safe to infer that with more equal distribution of wealth, um, this results in a higher chance for social upward mobility for everyone else. And my last point is that economic inequality gives the affluent more power and control um, over the lives of others to an unfathomable degree. So generally, if the wealth is unevenly distributed, this means the favor tends to side with the more affluent, um, just because they have more they're just able to access more resources. So in an article from LA Times, according to Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Michael Hiltzik, he states that there's been a significant drop in the middle class wealth in terms of home prices and collapsing stock values. And from this, 
most of the top 1% has been able to actually recover um, most of majority of that wealth lost from the middle class, while the bottom 90% have continued to substantially fall. So a case example that I'm going to give is, is urban gentrification. So in the Bay Area in San Francisco, um, housing prices are starting to go up, um, and with technological advances, it seems like only the affluent or more wealthier upper class are able to afford living there. And due to rising, rising housing prices, this resulted in a lot of San Franciscans to move to a lower income area, <coughs> such as Oakland, they have to relocate. So many of the more affluent can only afford to luxury in a city that was once affordable to most people, um, but leave no choice for others to relocate. So, of course, wealthy communities are going to continue existing, and wealth inequality is inevitable, and some might argue that it is a necessary evil. But, and so the people do deserve the wealth that they have accumulated, but it's the divide between the top 1% and the bottom 90% that doesn't do the less fortunate any justice. So to recap, wealth inequality is oppressive to those who are less fortunate because it gives less equal funding to programs and institutions that need it, uh, it negatively affects society's outlook on each other, and three, it gives the more affluent power and control over others while taking away from the less fortunate. Thank you. Well, I thought your proposition was clearer at the end of the speech than it was at the beginning. I know what the subject is, but the exact nature of your claim, I think, is uh, less certain, like I said, until you get to the end, uh, at least when it comes to the phrasing. The contents are nicely illustrated, though, and so I know exactly where you're going based on the preview that you've set up. Uh, internal signposting of the supporting points is clear. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, your information on the academic or the... Uh, resource distribution of educational uh, inf you know, resources. I think that needs a lot more development. Uh, there needs to be some discussion about how disproportionate those resources are, and there needs to be a demonstration that the difference in the resources is what's contributing to this wealth gap that you are talking about. Um, my guess would be, for instance, that uh, the people that you were talking about in the top 1% don't have to worry about the way the resources are distributed by the state because they just go to whatever schools they want, private schools, whatever it happens to be. It's the other folks that uh, where the wealth disparity is going to matter to some degree, like you're talking about public schools, for instance, and, some, and we don't even see how much different they are from one another. We know that there's a difference. I'm not disputing that there's a difference, uh, but uh, how significant that difference is and how big an impact it has, I think that that's mostly assumed in your argument. Uh, there are reasons to believe that it's true, but I think you need uh, better documentation of it. And the other thing that I think is missing is an explanation about why, uh, you know, or there's a, like a presupposition, again, that the resources are uh, what determines the success or failure there, as opposed to other conditions that might be a part of that process, which, by the way, might also be associated with wealth issues. Um, you know, the idea that 90 to 95 percent of the population would benefit from getting something from other people, uh, distributing the wealth a little bit differently. Well, obviously, if they are you know, in the one category and they don't have and the other category has and they're going to get more as a result, I think that's kind of self-serving. Uh, the question is, what kind of difference is it going to make? How much would it improve their chances of moving up into society, developing the kinds of... Uh, you know, uh, benefits that the wealthy have, I think that that's one of those things that's also kind of taken as a uh, presumption without necessarily being demonstrated. Uh, the <coughs> example on the third point concerning um, housing issues is a little abstract. I, I, the idea of gentrification 
being the source of the problem in San Francisco is assumed as opposed to what the demand is for the area, what the population is for the area, what the housing limits are for the area. I'm sure that there are a lot of things that contribute to why uh, it's not reachable for people in those areas to be able to purchase homes. And it's not, you know, you know the idea that it's simply because the rich people have all moved in and want all that area that I think needs a heck of a lot more proof than what you've got here. Um, you know, that, that seems to be, and, and that's an isolated example. I think you need some more examples of that sort of uh, behavior to illustrate your point and make a broader generalization. I like the summary at the end reminding us of what the main points were, and like I said, I thought you had a clear statement of what your purpose was at the end of the speech. All right, thank you.